Hi, welcome to my presentation on engineering for resiliency at scale. Um, I'm Prasad Kalyan Raman. I'm part of the AWS Infrastructure Services Organization. Been with Amazon for about uh, 17 years now. And I started off with our supply chain systems and then moved on to AWS. I've actually been a software engineer uh, pretty much my entire life. Um, so it's actually quite unusual for a software leader to be running an infrastructure team. But uh, over the last uh, multiple years that I've actually realized that there are so many concepts in software engineering that have parallels in infrastructure design as well. And so through my presentation, I'm actually going to be talking about some of these things for you all. I'm primarily going to focus on uh, power infrastructure in our data centers, um, but the concepts are very similar when you actually think about mechanical design as well. So hopefully you'll actually find this fairly engaging. So let's get started. Well, the first one is just to give you an idea about scale itself at AWS. So, you know, very briefly, an AWS region has multiple availability zones. Each availability zone is its independent fault domain. So we have independent power infrastructure um, services all run within a particular availability zone. To give you an idea of scale, our Virginia region has six availability zones. All our regions actually have at least three availability zones. Each availability zone has multiple data centers. So to give you an idea, our Virginia availability zones have about 20 data centers. So you're talking about 100 plus data centers just in Virginia alone. And our inter-DC traffic between these data centers is of the order of 10,000 plus terabits per second. Okay. So when you actually operate at this scale, the first thing that is actually important when you want to deal with resiliency is to actually make sure that your blast radius is much smaller. Right? So if you actually think about our evolution of how we actually went through data center design, you know, our initial set of data centers were actually built with UPSs and so on. And each UPS was servicing a lineup of about two megawatts or so. A lineup for us is a UPS plus a generator combination, right? And so if you think about it, you actually have like about 70 or so racks that are actually powered by a single UPS lineup, which is a combination of a utility plus a UPS plus a generator. We've actually changed the design over a period of time such that we've reduced our blast radius of any kind of a power event to literally 15 kilowatts, which means that it is a single rack which actually has a battery backup power inside it. Now, what this design does is actually, in addition to reducing blast radius, actually reduces our complexity as well, right? As you all probably know, some of the, some of the harder things to do with electrical power design is actually making sure that you understand the UPS operations and so on as well. Now, in addition to making sure that you reduce blast radius, the next important thing is making sure that you go through your single line diagrams and make sure that you actually have redundancy at every path along the way, right? And if you think about how we've actually designed our data centers, we never actually design our server racks with N power, N meaning that you still have utility backed up by a generator as well. And we actually don't leave that in our designs either. So we don't actually operate with N power. Our initial set of designs actually operated with what we call as N plus C. C stands for catcher for us. A catcher is basically a lineup, just another lineup that's available. As I said before, a lineup is utility plus a generator backup. And what we realized later on was that we actually need to design with N plus 2C and the reason why you need N plus 2C is because when you do any kind of maintenance on a particular lineup, like breaker maintenance and so on, you actually are vulnerable at that period of time because you've actually removed off redundancy. So you have reduced redundancy when you actually do things like maintenance. So we went to a design, our latest set of designs actually have N plus 2C, which means two catchers. That means two lineups which are independently available to be able to take load if you actually have any kind of problem on a primary lineup. The other thing we actually designed for was that we actually made sure that there was never a single point of failure across that entire electrical infrastructure, all the way from the, uh, the utility feed to the changeover panels, to the PDCs, to the ATSs. We actually moved the ATSs also over to the racks themselves, including the, back, the battery backup units on the racks. Now, how do you know that your redundancy works? Now, if you actually are a software leader, you know, the first thing you would actually say is never actually do something which you would actually just fail over just when you need it. Because when you need failover when you need it, it may not quite work, right? 
And so that's why, you know, generally you build active, active systems, but it's not necessarily easy to do that when you actually have physical infrastructure. So what we actually do is we test failover pretty frequently. And that's for both our electrical setup as well as our mechanical and cooling and all that as well, including our control systems. And we do a bunch of things to test live load transfers between our primary and backup lineups. So what we do is we actually induce failures such that we do induce real world failures like generator failures, we induce breaker breaker trips, we induce utility failures and so on. And we do that fairly frequently and we make sure that we are measuring all of that. We have quantifiable goals that we take on how many times we would do primary to backup failovers. And we learn from each one of those, those failovers as well. But you're going to see anomalies. You're going to see all kinds of anomalies in your production environment. And when you see these anomalies, you can actually design for them. But at some point or the other, you're actually going to be caught by some sort of anomaly that you've not seen before. And it's going to happen, right? And so the, some of these anomalies can be in the form of like upstream utility disruptions and the way those, those power signatures actually work, control system failures, baker maintenance failures, and name it, uh, you're going to see it. You'll also see some excursions in your own setup of your servers when you actually consume a lot of power on single lineups and so on. And you start litting, hitting over subscription limits. So we've done a set of things to actually make sure that we can self-heal from these anomalies. And that has actually paid us a lot of dividends along the way. So some of these examples uh, that I'm, going to, I'm not going to tell you exhaustively about every single self-healing system that we've built, but what we've actually done is that we've actually built self-healing systems that automatically move, in this particular case, medium voltage. We actually have two medium voltage lineups that are actually coming for a particular feed. And we automatically change over between these particular medium voltage distribution systems. Now, this is some automation that we've actually built. Another automation that we've built, which we internally call as backup, is to prevent overloading by making sure that we can automatically shed some load to catcher. So the advantage that we actually have is we have a, two independent lineups, which are called catchers, that are sitting out there. And so what we do is that we pre-select a set of racks that can actually automatically move to catcher to make sure that if we see any kind of oversubscription, this is an oversubscription protection mechanism that makes sure that you never drop IT load like that. And this is something that we've actually built in-house. It's automation that actually moves most power from primary, primary to backups automatically. Now, with, with the, the size of the infrastructure that we actually run, it's never a question of when, it's a question of, it's never a question of if, but it's a question of when. And so what you have to do is you have to actually plan for these kinds of disruptions. And we plan for those disruptions both in our services as well as in our redundancy as well as our ability to actually recover from those events fairly quickly. So what I'm going to actually talk to you about is a fairly unusual event that actually happened in Virginia for us in December. This is so unusual for us that we actually work with multiple of our, of our UPS manufacturers to try and actually solve for these kind of events that actually happen. So what happened in, in December, it was December 22nd for us, was that in one of the data centers in Virginia, we actually had a design which is based on a centralized UPS. As I had actually mentioned before, our later set of designs kind of moved away from that concept. And we actually have battery backup units in our individual servers. We have ATSs on the servers themselves. We don't have a centralized ATS as well. And this was a data center that actually had a centralized UPS on a particular lineup. And what happened there was that the UPS rectifiers were actually unable to maintain precise voltage match between the utility. And so the utility was fluctuating so very frequently for us that the rectifiers couldn't maintain that, that precise voltage match. So when the uh, UPS breakers, input breakers closed, we ended up in a situation where the voltage difference actually caused a pretty significant surge in current for us. And that resulted in IGPD VSAT events. Because of the poor quality of the, of the utility itself, the inverter was not tracking the bypass. And so when we had this IGPD VSAT event, we ended up in a situation where we interrupted transfer to bypass. We did an interrupted transfer to the bypass. So we actually dropped IT load. Now, this is 
clearly an unusual event. In fact, this fraud, this this fault mode was so very rare that it actually happened with one specific UPS manufacturer. And one of the major contributors for this that we actually later dug on, dug in with the manufacturer and looked through their firmware as well, was because of the extremely short rectified requalification on the UPS design. So we've been working with them and we actually changed that design such that we don't qualify the utility when we have these frequent fluctuations. So those are some of the some of the mitigations that we did. What we did was we actually worked with the UPS manufacturers. We did a global firmware update to make sure that we were not susceptible to these high frequency utility disturbances. The power signature was also extremely unusual as well for us. The other thing that we did was we had to go and test and remediate like 100% of the UPSs across the entire fleet that were similarly susceptible. And as I said before, we've actually kind of moved away from the centralized UPS design to a, to a design where we actually have battery backup units on our individual servers, which actually helps us with our blast radius as well. Right. So to recap, like if you look through our evolution, you know, we started off with understanding that like we need to actually have N plus C. We realized that when we did things like maintenances, we were reducing our redundancy. So we actually went to a design which is based on N plus 2C. Then we said, well, like we don't want to actually have these centralized UPSs that would actually have large blast radiuses. We actually went to a design that pretty much ensured that we had redundancy across the entire lineup like that. Then we actually built what we call as self-healing systems, such that when we have these kinds of excursions, we can automatically heal from those set of use cases. And we automated that as well. And we, and we followed a similar pattern for our mechanical infrastructure as well. I've primarily covered electrical infrastructure in this entire presentation. But it's been a really fun journey for us, and we've been learning across the way, and we've actually made it fairly resilient. And, and the fact that we actually run our, our regions with multiple availability zones ensure that our customers run across multiple availability zones and have independent fault domains across these availability zones has actually improved our availability fairly significantly. Thank you.